Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. Swiping on Tinder always felt a bit silly, but my friend Zach convinced me to give it a real try after my last relationship ended. To my surprise, I hit it off messaging with Olivia right away. Her profile showed a down-to-earth middle school teacher who shared my love of indie movies and hiking. After a week of non-stop witty banter and furry jokes, I worked up the nerve to suggest meeting up for coffee downtown. Olivia said she'd prefer something more private and offered to text her address so I could pick her up Saturday afternoon. A bit forward, maybe, but I appreciated a confident woman and started prepping a charming movie-themed mixed CD for the car. That Saturday morning, I probably changed outfits three times hoping to make a good first impression on Olivia. Zach teased me via text, shocked to see me putting such effort towards an online dating match. But our messaging chemistry truly excited me in a way no app connection had prior. Humming along to the custom romantic comedy soundtrack I curated, I pulled up outside a small bungalow-style house matching Olivia's texted address. I did a quick breath check and pocket pat down before heading up the front walk, noting the place looked pretty dark inside from mid-afternoon. Chalking it up to heavy curtains or something, I knocked briskly on the red door, feeling my earlier confidence wane slightly. After a lengthy pause with no discernible interior movement, I heard the knob turn slowly. Still no Olivia appeared when the door cracked open, but a gruff male voice told me to come inside and have a seat. Alarm sounded faintly as I took tentative steps into the shadowy front room. Before I could inquire about Olivia, the guy emerged from the gloom with another larger man close behind him. With dawning horror, I realized both wore makeshift masks and wielded weapons crudely fashioned from duct tape and kitchen knives. My shocked brain fumbled for logic as the first guy gestured aggressively for me to hand over my wallet. When I hesitated, still processing the surreal trap, the larger brute forcefully kicked my knees out from under me. Sprawled helplessly on stained carpet, my mental haze cleared instantly. The smaller intruder rifled ruthlessly through my pockets as waves of humiliation and fury crashed over me. My fake date, Olivia, had clearly orchestrated this entire ambush, luring stupidly eager me straight into a ruthless robbery. Fists clenched tightly against creeping despair. I bit back angry tears, realizing I had ignored all the warning signs in my quest for connection. With my emptied wallet and keys now confiscated, irrational desperation flooded my system. As the brutish thieves debated what to steal from my sightline visible car next, some primal survival instinct awoke within me. In one swift move, I swept my leg hard, directly connecting with the nearest guy's ankle. As he stumbled cursing in pain, I bolted frantically for the still-cracked doorway, ignoring the outraged screams trailing me. Fueled by a volatile adrenaline surge, I sprinted down the driveway and flung myself behind the wheel of my faithful old hatchback. Tires spinning recklessly on the gravel road, I spit off blindly from the scene of violation, struggling to swallow panicked breaths. Only after several turns did I find the presence of mind to start checking the mirrors, obsessively expecting vengeful pursuit. But the winding street behind me remained mercifully empty aside from a squirrel gathering the corns. Having created some temporary distance, crashing reality set in regarding my plight. I drove aimlessly with no wallet, phone, or sense of direction, still reeling emotionally from cruel betrayal at the whim of cyber strangers. Swallowing the last bit of pride remaining, I made my way awkwardly to the nearby police station. The officer taking my statement hardly stifled her bored indifference, reciting rogue questions between yawns. I recounted feeling targeted online, lured by the promise of intimacy to a compromised location far from my own turf or defenses. When I showed the offensive fake dating profile that goaded my trust as evidence, the cop just chuckled. Clearly the halls here brimmed already with countless similar tales of deception thanks to modern hookup apps. But something about my crestfallen face or quivering account of fleeing armed attackers swayed her typically jaded outlook. At the end, she patted my shoulder gently reminding me that virtual spaces overflowed with brilliant performers and master manipulators. I clung desperately to her reassurance that even the savviest soul could prove susceptible to customized attacks on personal insecurities and secret longing. 
So the utter violation and disgust I felt with myself in aftermath nearly overwhelmed all available coping strategies. That harrowing ordeal with phony Olivia and her weapon-wielding accomplices left scars well beyond the fading bruises and temporarily frozen credit. In insomnia played weeks that passed, I analyzed endlessly all subtle conversational flags I must have missed blinded by my own relationship hopes. I decided ultimately to abandon the perilous and triggering world of online matchmaking indefinitely. Too raw and unforgiving still, I wrongly blamed myself for ignoring common sense and safety measures in the face of likely too good to be true attention. Over painful months spent rebuilding identity and esteem, wise friends helped shift my perspective. They reminded me creeps and criminals dwelling anonymously online bore full responsibility for orchestrating calculated harm. No victim deserved even portion blame for believing others might nurture intimacy without self-serving or sinister ulterior motives. And by sharing my haunting experience openly once wounds healed into wisdom, I might prevent other searchers from meeting similar cruel fates. Though we all craved connection at times in frustratingly disconnected modernity, I learned to seek meaning first from within before risking my spirit out among the cyber wolves hunting the vulnerable. I still feel embarrassed thinking back on my brief dating fiasco last year with Nathan, who I met through Tinder. When we first matched, he portrayed himself as a highly successful entrepreneur, boasting nonstop about being a wealthy CEO who owned multiple impressive companies. I later discovered those were complete fabrications to impress me. In reality, Nathan was just an average junior employee at McDonald's with no businesses or investments to his name at all. Initially, Nathan seemed honest enough from his Tinder profile in our first series of text conversations. His bio mentioned entrepreneurship being one of his greatest passions in life. I naturally assumed he meant he aspired to start his own business someday, not that he currently helmed multi-million dollar corporations. Based on the recent college grad vibe of his smiling photos, I pegged Nathan as around my age, probably still searching for his career path like most 22-year-olds. But I couldn't have been more wrong about him. When we met up for our first date at a trendy new speakeasy lounge downtown, Nathan regaled me for hours with wildly impressive tales of his globe-trading lifestyle and important meetings with celebrity investors. He referenced elite business conferences he had supposedly been invited to speak at in places as far-flung as Dubai and Hong Kong. At one point, he even paused our conversation to take a very urgent call from his West Coast partners, stepping away from the table for several minutes to speak in hushed tones. I'm ashamed to admit it, at first, I was rather enthralled as I sipped my lavender martini and listened to Nathan name drop famous entrepreneurs he had allegedly collaborated with. He really sold the image of a mature, refined wonderkind who had amazingly built a business empire before even turning 25. I felt flattered that such a successful young genius businessman seemed interested in me and made time in his busy schedule to go out. It wasn't until our third date that Nathan's elaborate stories first began to raise some doubts. We were strolling downtown after a fancy dinner when we passed a rowdy group of young guys around our age, wearing McDonald's uniforms and joking loudly on their way to start a late shift. Nathan made a snooty comment about how pathetic it was that some people our age chose minimum wage fast food work over trying to make something meaningful of themselves. I bristled a bit at his condescending attitude and pointed out that not everyone had the chance or resources right out of college to become a wealthy entrepreneur. He got oddly defensive and snippy, questioning my motivations and business savvy. His haughty reaction to those guys stuck with me. It was the first seed of doubt planted in my mind about the veracity of Nathan's alleged business success. When I got home that night, I decided to investigate him further. I spent over an hour trying to Google any trace of the elite corporations he claimed to have founded and operated. Unsurprisingly, I could find absolutely no evidence that any of them actually existed. The next time we got dinner, I started gently pressing Nathan for more concrete details about his various multi-million dollar business ventures. He became flustered, stumbling over his words until the stories completely unraveled under my persistent scrutiny. Finally, he blurted out sheepishly that he may have innocently exaggerated about his entrepreneurial career just a tiny bit, in order to impress a classy, beautiful girl like myself. As it turned out, Nathan was far from being a jet-setting CEO. He was in fact just a junior cashier at that McDonald's who walked by, likely jealous of his former classmates, 
who got to live carefree party lifestyles. I was really disappointed he had been so deliberately dishonest from the start, but figured maybe he truly admired entrepreneurship and just had poor execution when trying to portray that image to win me over. Against my better judgment, I decided to give Nathan a second chance. But the lies and evasiveness continued. Whenever I asked simple questions about where he lived or worked, Nathan dodged giving direct answers. He gave vague, ever-changing responses about what part of town he supposedly resided in. When I offered to pick him up for dates, he always insisted on meeting me places instead. More red flags popped up when he declined my request to see his apartment, making excuses that it was too messy and embarrassing right now. After nearly two months of this, I finally got fed up and directly demanded Nathan tell me the full truth about where and how he actually lived. After hemming and hawing for several minutes, staring at the tablecloth, Nathan finally admitted he didn't really reside in any of the upscale downtown lofts he had described to me before. In reality, he rented a small basement room in his parents' modest suburban home about 40 minutes outside the city. Again, his living situation itself wasn't necessarily bad or shameful in my eyes. But the ongoing deception about major parts of his life was very troublesome. He swore up and down that he resolved to be completely honest with me going forward now that the truth was out. And foolishly soft-hearted as I was, I chose to give Nathan yet another chance. That wavering resolve of mine evaporated instantly the day I walked into the downtown McDonald's for a quick lunch and saw Nathan behind the counter, wearing the restaurant's uniform and name tag. The shock and disbelief must have been all over my face when I recognized him serving customers. Nathan looked utterly mortified when he spotted me waiting in line. In that jarring moment, I knew without a doubt that Nathan's endless tall tales and secrecy about mundane details of his everyday reality were ultimately too big a hurdle for our budding relationship to overcome. As much as I cared about him, the constant duplicity surrounding major parts of his life made it impossible for me to ever fully trust him as a partner. I wanted someone I could have faith in completely, and that clearly wasn't Nathan. I ended things for good soon after in one final painful conversation where I calmly but firmly explained my reasons for needing a clean break. Of course, Nathan tried justifying his lies as harmless, claiming he had planned to gradually come clean once we got more serious down the road. So picture this stuck in a never-ending saga of pandemic weekends. I found myself swiping through Tinder out of sheer boredom. And bam, I stumbled upon Jane, this artsy chick around my age with a pixie cut, a nose ring, and a funky vibe that just screamed cool. Her profile was a treasure trove of cute pics, and we bonded over our love for indie movies and painting. I mean, she was the antidote to my sweatpants clad, couch-dwelling existence. The banter flowed, the laughter ensued, and suddenly, the prospect of meeting this girl felt like the cure to my pandemic blues. So, after what felt like ages of witty texting, I gathered the courage to pop the question. Asked Jane out, that is. And guess what? She not only said yes, but suggested hitting up this trendy downtown theater. They played indie flicks and served cocktails with names so cute you'd think they were flirting with you. Now, this wasn't exactly your budget-friendly, run-of-the-mill Tinder date, but who cares when fun Jane is in the picture? I was just stoked she said yes and ready to pull out all the stops to impress her. She suggested meeting at this trendy little theater downtown that plays indie flicks and serves cocktails with cute names. I mean, not exactly cheap for a first Tinder date, but hey, I was just excited she said yes. I wanted to impress Fun Jane since Woody Banner was flowing so well between us leading up to it. I prepaid for our tickets to this quirky French romance film she mentioned wanting to see. Then I stuffed my pockets with enough cash to cover overpriced cocktails and maybe a snack if things went well. I'd even put on my lucky shirt, figured tonight called for pulling out all the stops. When I got to the theater, Artsy Jane waved me over to these cool velvet couches right up front. The retro artsy lighting bounced off her cute little forehead rings when she looked up at me with a slay smile. Went ahead and got us the best seats in the house up front. Hope you don't mind me taking charge on the seating arrangements, Jane said with a flirty hair flip. In my dazzled state, I didn't even process that I'd probably end up paying double by letting her treat for the premium seats. Rookie mistake, bro. But dazzling Jane just kept smiling at me with those deep green eyes, her short pixie cut perfectly framing her cheekbones in the moody theater lighting. 
I try playing it cool, making Jane laugh by dramatically reading every eccentric movie description from the program out loud. She cracked up at my theatrical interpretations of foreign indie films, at one point wiping tears of laughter from her eyes. Man, the playful banter was really flowing smoothly. This date was off to an awesome start already. When the lights went down as the movie trailer started, I slightly reached over the velvet couch armrest to hold Jane's hand like a nervous middle schooler. I was pleasantly surprised when artsy Jane grinned and warmly interlaced her fingers with mine instead of pulling away. Mum getting cozy already. Seemed like we were really hitting it off. Between the witty jokes and natural hand-holding, my hopes started running wild about taking quirky Jane to the downtown craft fair next weekend for date number two. As the credits finally rolled, Chatty Jane instantly started analyzing the director's brilliant use of color symbolism and immersive sets that completely transported us into the world of the lovers. I jokingly asked if she writes indie film critiques in her spare time, or if this passion was special treatment just for lucky me. Pretty smooth line, right? Well, apparently it worked, because Jane glanced sideways with a cute smirk and wink, replying, maybe I saved my best material for charming guys. My confidence instantly shot through the roof imagining how I'd bragged to the guys about my new indie film buff girlfriend. Jane was seriously the whole artsy package. I could already envision more quirky downtown date nights with her on my arm, gallery openings, poetry readings, improv shows. Yep, I was positively smitten. Surely she felt this fiery chemistry too, right? We strolled out hand in hand with Jane, still passionately debating the ending. She said she was getting hungry, so I suggested grabbing a bite nearby to keep our artsy date night going. Unfortunately, Sneaky Jane insisted she already had dinner plans and an hour with visiting family so she better dash, but she reached up to kiss my cheek and thank me for the magical evening before bouncing down the street. I watched her go with a dorky grin plastered on my face, until I checked my buzzing phone to see a Venmo charge. That little scam artist had covered our whole tab with my prepaid card while I was in the bathroom. Then upon closer inspection, several outgoing calls from Janie Wright when the lights went down. Probably an accomplice. Next day when I tried messaging Janky Jane about repaying me, she had already deleted her Tinder profile. Never heard from that swindler again after she played me for a sap. I felt like such an idiot realizing it was all an act. And poof, my dream indie girlfriend vanished into the LA night. Want to hear about my horrifying real-life Tinder stalker experience? Of, oh, it still gives me chills. So last year, in a moment of pandemic boredom, I downloaded this hot new dating app called Tinder that a few friends had luck with. After jokingly swiping through a bunch of random dudes in my area, I started chatting with Jeff. His profile seemed chilled, cute graphic designer, likes indie music and craft beers, lots of pics with the same group of friends at concerts. Well, one night after a particularly witty meme exchange, Jeff asked if I'd be down to me for a drink sometime. I know, I know, being some random dude from the internet wasn't too smart, but cute Jeff had been making me laugh nonstop for weeks. Plus, my social life had gotten pretty stale between virtual happy hours, so I figured one casual beer couldn't hurt, right? We picked a super public spot downtown on a Saturday with a plan to make a quick hello. At first, Jeff seemed totally normal, if not a little awkward. We covered the usual first date small talk about jobs, pop culture, etc., but after about an hour of run-of-the-mill chatting while we nursed our beers, I started getting a weird vibe. Jeff kept circling back to the same topics no matter how much I tried changing the subject. First, it was how cripplingly lonely quarantine had been for him, stuck in his tiny studio apartment for weeks on end. Then he started rambling about various people at his graphic design job who supposedly mistreated and underappreciated his creative visions. I nodded along politely, silently wondering if Jeff's abrasive personality played any role in these conflicts. But then he shifted gears to vent about his endless string of psycho ex-girlfriends who had all cruelly dumped him out of the blue, which was a huge red flag. Jeff went into almost disturbing levels of detail about each woman and every perceived slight or betrayal by them. One allegedly cheated on him with his best friend. Another supposedly stole money from his wallet and disappeared. A third had tried to baby trap him by lying about birth control. 
On and on, he went about these unhinged, vindictive women from his past who had wrecked his ability to trust. By the third or fourth unflattering tirade, I was starting to think Stalker Jeff was actually the common denominator of chaos and dysfunction in these relationships gone wrong. But he was so deep into his conspiratorial rants about manipulation that he seemed oblivious to my obvious cringing. Eventually, Jeff exhausted his ex-girlfriend tirade material, so he abruptly switched years to interrogating me about my past relationships and dating history. He scooted his bar stool closer and closer, hitting in my personal space as he demanded intimate details about every guy I'd ever introduced to my parents or traveled with. The aggressive questioning made my skin crawl with disgust. I politely but firmly steered the invasive conversation elsewhere, but Jeff clearly had zero social awareness or respect for my boundaries. He just got more aggravated the more I evaded his hyper-personal questions, leaving me terrified imagining how he might react if we were alone and I couldn't escape the confrontation. This was quickly escalating into a dangerous situation that set off all my inner alarm bells. So when I finally finished my drink and began hinting about needing to take off, Jeff switched to outright anger. His voice got louder demanding to know private things like exactly where downtown I lived, specific friends I hang out with, and what my daily work schedule is like. By now, my inner alarm bells were screaming at me to escape this unhinged weirdo immediately. When I tried to slide off the bar stool, Jeff aggressively blocked my path out. He got in my face nearly shouting that I couldn't leave yet, we have a special soulmate connection. What the actual hell, bro? You've known me for less than 90 minutes. Thank God the bartender suddenly asked if I was alright, giving me the perfect chance to say my roommate was expecting me for dinner. I practically ran outside and just started walking fast down the busy street, too scared to wait for my Uber at the bar. Of course, creepy Jeff followed, begging me not to leave so soon. He kept trying to hold my hand and asking personal questions about my job and workout classes, and basically my whole freaking life. When I turned the corner towards my neighborhood, my blood ran cold, realizing Jeff was still behind me. That's when it hit me. This unhinged dude had somehow figured out where I live. No way was I leading the stalker right to my door. So in desperation, I beelined to the nearest open business, a crowded nail salon, and told the startled receptionist I was being followed by a stranger from the internet. Thank God the awesome salon ladies immediately locked the door and called the cops without Jeff knowing. A few minutes later, two beefy officers hauled him away for questioning about harassment. But since the whole Tinder date had technically been consensual, they couldn't arrest stalker Jeff. Still, hitting a stern warning from the police seemed to spook him enough that I never heard from creepy Jeff again. Now I keep pepper spray on me 24 7 and watch my back walking anywhere at night. Call me paranoid, but Jeff could easily make new dating profiles to track down victims. I still have panic attacks imagining what might have happened if I'd brought that psycho home without realizing the red flags. Needless to say, I deleted all dating apps after that traumatic meetup. No more swiping roulette for this girl. I'll stick to mean people the old-fashioned way from here on out, thank you very much. But let me tell you, yeah, online dating game is freaking terrifying. Fellow single ladies, stay safe out there and trust your gut if something feels off. I had the single most terrifying experience of my life just this past weekend when I met up for a date with a young woman named Amy, who I had initially matched with on Tinder. We went to see a movie downtown on Saturday night and stopped for drinks together afterwards at a dimly lit dive bar. Everything seemed perfectly normal at first as we chatted casually about getting to know each other. But within minutes of Amy bringing me a cocktail she had gone to order at the bar, I began feeling extremely dizzy and flushed my limbs going numb and unresponsive. The last thing I recall is her just watching impassively as I collapsed and blacked out face down at our table, paralyzed and unable to call for help. When I finally came to disoriented and still sluggish, Amy had vanished without a trace into the night along with my wallet containing cash and cards. All I have is fragmented memories and some blurry, ambiguous bar footage that provides almost no real answers about her identity or motives. The police investigation stalled rapidly due to lack of concrete evidence. Nearly a week later, I remained consumed by fear, anxiety, shame, and unanswered questions about what exactly happened that night and who Amy really was beneath the sweet facade. 
did utter violation I feel knowing she was able to so cunningly gain my trust that make me her victim without consequence eats away at my soul. I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully move past it or trust blindly on dates again. Amy and I had chatted casually through Tinder messages for a couple weeks and seemed to really hit it off intellectually. We were both around 28 years old, loved indie films, frequented dive bars, and bonded over obscure music and art. When she suggested meeting up on Saturday night, I was thrilled by the prospect of meeting this captivating woman in person. We planned to go see a new artsy horror movie playing downtown, then stop for drinks at a hole-in-the-wall bar nearby after to discuss the film. It sounded like a perfect introvert date, or so I foolishly thought then. We met outside the old ornate theater, and Amy looked just like her photos, petite with bleach-blonde pixie-cut hair, edgy vintage clothes, and a cute shy smile. During the movie, I was a bit disappointed we didn't talk much, but figured she was just really into the film. Afterwards, we walked a few blocks to a dimly lit dive bar she had suggested. I noticed the route took us away from more crowded areas, but didn't think much of it then. We sat down at two empty spots at the bar in the back corner. When Amy offered kindly to get the first round of drinks, I nodded and gave her cash for mine. Maybe ten minutes later, she appeared cradling the cocktails and set mine in front of me with an almost smug grin. We toasted getting to know each other and took a few sips. She seemed intent on watching my reactions closely, but again I chalked it up to first aid jitters. About fifteen minutes into our lively chat about work, music, and other innocuous topics, I began feeling suddenly very dizzy and off. I tried subtly shaking it off, but a lean numbness was spreading rapidly through my limbs, making it difficult to lift the glass or even sit upright. When I tried to tell Amy something felt very wrong, my tongue felt thick and the words came out badly slurred. The last coherent memory I have is her just sitting there placidly sipping her own drink, stone-faced, as she watched me gradually lose muscle control and collapse forward, paralyzed and unable to call out for help. Then everything went completely dark in a matter of seconds. I have no concept of how much later it was when I finally came to my face stuck to the grimy bar surface and the previously busy bar now mostly empty. Every part of me felt impossibly heavy and clouded as I struggled to lift my head and focus my blurry gaze to look for Amy, but she had vanished completely along with any traces she even been there. I managed to weakly gesture the bartender over in a panic to ask what happened to my date, but he said the blonde girl I had been sitting with left alone a short while ago, casually telling him on her way out that her friend had too much to drink. She apparently expressed no concern over the fact I was unconscious and unresponsive. Regality then hit me like a freight train as I realized my wallet was also missing from my pocket, which could only mean one horrendous thing. Amy had spiked my drink somehow, waited emotionlessly until I was blacked out, robbed me, and then simply walked out unseen into the night. I shakily tried to explain what I could remember happening to the skeptical bartender, and frantically asked if I could see their security tapes. The cameras barely captured Amy digging through my pockets and removing something before leaving alone with a chilling look of satisfaction. Besides us sitting together earlier, there were no other identifiable traces of this enigma. Somehow still struggling to think and move straight, I took a cab home feeling more terrified than I knew was possible. As soon as I could focus enough, I called the police to report what had occurred. Groggy and traumatized, I recounted everything I could piece together to them. But the officers warned date cases like this rarely yielded many tangible leads, as the perpetrators were masters of stealth and deception. The entire weekend that followed, I was consumed by endless panic attacks, cold sweats, crushing shame, and the infinite unanswered questions swirling in my aching mind. Had Amy been targeting me as a premeditated easy robbery mark all along? How and when did she possibly slip something in my drink without me noticing? What exactly had she drugged me with to completely paralyze me in seconds? Would this monster now come after me again since she knew where I lived? I spent countless torturous hours scurrying Tinder profiles and social media for any possible traces of Amy or clues to her real identity. Of course the sweet name and cute photos she had used were completely fake and untraceable as I should have realized. Just as police warned, their investigation completely stalled within days due to the masterful lack of any concrete evidence or leads. I never received any answers about who this Amy truly was or what ultimately became of her. And that almost makes it worse 
knowing my assailant is still roaming free out there seeking her next target with that same disarming charm. I never fathomed my mundane Tinder dating experiences could devolve into something so disturbingly sinister. After a string of bland but passable first dates, I matched with a guy named Brad who seemed relatively affable. Smart, employed, clever banter, basically promising compared to my usual swipe-based small talk. Those first few lightly flirtatious outings went smoothly enough over after-work drinks as we shared typical get-to-know-you conversations about jobs, pop culture, life in the city. But thinking back, undercurrents of unease stirred even then. An overly complimentary remark, fleeting unreadable look, pressing me for another date despite my noncommittal smiles. Subtle oddities I tried shrugging off, determined to give these digital era setups a fair chance before relegating Brad to my underwhelming dating misfires pile. But that nagging hesitation resurfaced more insistently in little ways. First during dinner, when Brad offhandedly mentioned my workplace company, a detail I definitely hadn't shared yet. Uneasy with him, somehow discovering private information, I fielded panicked texts from friends insisting this breach signaled stalker red flags. Still, maybe just an awkward conversational fumble rather than true warning sign, I rationalized while sleeping with one eye open. I even reluctantly agreed to a third date, attempting to clarify relationship boundaries if we kept seeing each other. But Brad's responses morphed instantly cloying rather than simply over-eager, smothering me in too much too soon intensity no fledgling connection could healthily sustain. I finally drew the line after he showed up uninvited at a girl's night happy hour, instantly crashing the lighthearted mood. Making anxious excuses, I went home early to reassess why I kept giving this presumptuous guy infinite chances when my gut screamed walk away. Was I the out of touch interpreting dates? Or just desperate to justify online matchmaking odds? Either way, I finally messaged Brad firmly, but politely later, that I just didn't see long term potential, so we should probably stop seeing each other romantically. Rather than accept my gentle letdown, Brad unleashed a barrage of unhinged emotional terrorism, unlike anything I ever imagined from simple online dating. His onslaught began with pleading voicemail rants to demand I justify exactly why I rejected him after he invested so much effort wooing me. When I refused to provide fodder feeding his entitlement, he alternated beg and berate tactics insisting no sane woman would dump an amazing guy like him without giving a real man ample chances to prove himself. His twisted logic concluded I owed him yet more dates to make my final judgment with clarity after bonding so profoundly. As I stuck to my insistence on cutting ties, Brad's initially desperate rages morphed into sinister manipulation efforts to punish my defiance. He hijacked my social media accounts to post provocative statuses and photos inviting vulgar harassment by strangers. He signed my email up for offensive mailing lists ensuring endless filthy spam I couldn't halt without new accounts. Most creepily, he had obscure personal gifts delivered to shock and unsettle me. A bouquet of two dozen red roses arrived at my office lobby, with every stem brutally snapped in half, thorns pointed outward. No card beyond a scribble of the infinity symbol. Even more disturbing, an unmarked package appeared at my home containing various bizarre objects clearly referencing distinct private conversations from our past dates. The nonsensical assortment became increasingly vulgar and threatening over subsequent mystery deliveries. Though no return labels or notes ever revealed the sender's identity, the chilling message screamed loud and clear that Brad enjoyed proving he could still violate my space whenever he chose. I finally worked up the courage to contact local police about the mounting harassment and stalking. But because no outright criminal threats or actions occurred beyond general creepiness, they emphasized limitations in becoming involved at that time. They left the full burden on me to somehow halt 
or evade the shocking abuse entirely independently. Though Brad seemed perpetually at least one unseen step ahead in plotting his next trauma campaign. Soon afterwards, Photocopied flyers appeared taped all over my neighborhood with my full name circled threateningly in red marker. The ambiguously menacing notes seemed intentionally crafted to brute force invading my psyche, attacking from the shadows just like Brad himself. Each new encroachment effectively dismantled protective boundaries I desperately tried erecting against his sabotage of any sense of security or autonomy. I oscillated between rage at Brad's demonic obsession with me and despair at police apathy leaving me utterly alone to combat this personalized terrorism. Every attempt to rebuild my life only triggered exponentially more flagrant efforts to shatter normalcy. Brad made unambiguously clear he would never cease haunting me in some capacity for daring to reject his deviant interest. Soon that despair morphed over to hypervigilance, as I realized his shadow haunted everywhere I dared show my face. Coffee shop staff mentioned a man lurking to ask probing questions about my habits right at closing time. Favorite boutiques received strange calls seeking intel on my clothing tastes. Even cautious neighbors whispered about a guy endlessly circling our apartment parking lot peering at unit numbers. None could fully ID him beyond some tall, pale dude with dark hair asking intrusive specifics that betrayed intimate knowledge. Certainly, no one from my actual social circles. The gaslighting shell game continued with unfamiliar vehicles appearing randomly wherever I drove, only to vanish by the time I circled back for evidence. Exit a building and glimpse a dark figure ducking behind a corner seconds too late. Wake up to foreign objects placed ominously on my own doorstep overnight. Hundreds of provocations blending life and nightmare, until I could scarcely function for fear of the next trauma manifestation. Somewhere in that feverish descent towards emotional breakdown, perspective shifted. Understanding crystallized that Brad's demonic fixation would only cease by forcibly removing his infection from my ravaged psyche at any cost. Perhaps somewhere in his sociopathic manipulation, he even believed possessing my soul equaled a relationship, rather than outright mental terror. Regardless, reclaiming sanity and safety now relied upon resolutely confronting the very monster I unwittingly invited past barriers never breached before. Even acknowledging the likely finality beyond that inevitable reckoning. And so resigned yet determined, I now set events in motion offstage from his crazed puppeteer choreography. Still can't believe I let this happen. I'm usually so much more careful, but I guess I let my guard down and paid the price. It started off innocently enough, just a Tinder match with a woman named Anna. Or at least, that's what she told me her name was. Who knows if it was even real? We had a pleasant enough chat over the app and she seemed normal, so when she suggested meeting up for drinks I said yes. We agreed to go to this trendy new bar downtown that night. I arrived first and texted her that I had grabbed a table. A few minutes later, pretty brunette who matched her photos walked in. I assumed it must be Anna. She greeted me with a friendly hug when I walked in as if we were already old pals. We settled into a cozy booth and I was struck by how at ease I immediately felt in Anna's presence. She had such a warm, inviting energy about her. The conversation flowed so smoothly, touching on travels, pop culture, and other typical first aid topics. I found myself opening up more than usual about my job, family, and interests. Anna was a great listener, asking thoughtful follow-up questions and making witty remarks that kept me laughing. After about 30 minutes of easy back and forth, the bartender stopped by to see if we wanted another round. Before I could even respond, Anna jumped in saying she thought she recognized our bartender from someplace, though she couldn't put her finger on where. She jokingly asked if an old friend could get a couple drinks on the house tonight. The bartender squinted at her for a minute, then broke into a smile. I knew you looked familiar, he exclaimed, though it seemed forced. Let me hook you guys up real nice. He swiftly produced two shots of tequila along with a gin and tonic for me and a vodka cranberry for Anna. We cheersed and both took our shots then chased them with long sips of our cocktails. 
Anna was delighted, remarking how she loved little perks like free drinks from old pals. I admit I was also pretty thrilled at the VIP treatment. It all seemed innocent at the time. As the night wore on, I gradually began feeling dizzy and disoriented. The bar wall seemed to tilt and sway around me. I had trouble focusing on Anna's face across the table, which kept blurring in and out. When I tried to stand up at one point to go to the restroom, I nearly toppled over before catching myself on the table. The last thing I remember clearly was Anna leaning toward me to talk over the music, her voice echoing strangely like we were underwater. After that, everything faded to black as whatever drug she'd slipped me fully kicked in. I have only hazy recollections of Anna tugging me toward the exit, the night air hitting my face, and streetlights whirling overhead before I lost consciousness completely. The next thing I knew, I was startling awake under harsh fluorescent lights. I looked around, confused about where I was. It took me a minute to realize I was in a hospital room, hooked up to a bag. A nurse explained I had been found unconscious outside the bar and brought in by ambulance. As I became more coherent, I had a sinking realization that my wallet, phone, and car keys were all missing from my pockets. The nurse said no personal effects had been brought in with me. I started to panic, wondering what had happened to my stuff. That's when it dawned on me. Anna must have slipped something in those free drinks at the bar to knock me out and rob me. She had seemed so sweet and normal. I never would have suspected she had ill intentions. But it all made terrible sense. The doctor said I had clearly been incapacitated chemically, but all the tests had come back clean for common date rate drugs. Whatever Anna gave me was sophisticated and left no trace. I still felt disturbingly violated. As soon as I was discharged from the hospital, I tried contacting Anna, but she had of course unmatched me on Tinder already. I had no way to reach her or track her down. I went to the police and explained the whole terrible ordeal, but they said there wasn't much to go on. They contacted the bar and checked their security footage, but oddly enough there was no sign of Anna or me there that night. The tapes must have been tampered with or erased. This woman had planned things meticulously to leave no loose ends. In the following weeks, I became almost obsessed with trying to uncover Anna's true identity. I knew she'd probably use fake names and burner phones, but there had to be some way to find out who she really was and press charges. I hired a private investigator who looked into similar drugging cases in the area to see if he could establish a pattern or a connection. I even staked out that bar a few more times, hoping Anna would turn up trying the same scam on some other unsuspecting guy. But she was a total ghost. My bank accounts were eventually drained by all the unauthorized charges to my stolen cards. My driver's license also had to be replaced, which was a hassle. But the worst part was just feeling so violated, knowing this devious woman was still out there somewhere plotting her next act. I became much more distrustful of people I met on dating apps after that. I used to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but now I was wary of each new match. Were they genuinely interested in me or just sizing me up as a potential target? It made dating feel more dangerous and cynical. I suppose I was flattered at first. It's not every day a guy you meet on Tinder starts treating you like royalty. Fancy restaurants, expensive gifts, non-stop compliments. Joseph seemed like a true gentleman, eager to impress me with over-the-top dates most women only dream of. Had I known it was all a facade calculated to make me lower my guard, I never would have swiped right in the first place. After matching, he immediately began courting me with elaborate outings to five-star restaurants I could never afford on my own. He knew all the exclusive hot spots and had bottles of champagne brought to the table without even glancing at the bill. It was thrilling to be the center of attention, all eyes on me as I entered on Joseph's arm. He reveled in playing the role of my lavish suitor. At the end of each extravagant evening, he would walk me home and present me with yet another exquisite bouquet of roses or orchids. No man had ever made me feel so special before. Even as the gifts became excessive, I told myself he was just an incurable romantic. So when Joseph asked to extend our fifth upscale dinner date by coming inside my flat for a nightcap, I hesitated. Not because his behavior raised any red flags yet. I was simply worried he would judge my humble apartment after whining and dining me so spectacularly all week. But he pressed the issue, demanding to know why I still hadn't invited him in after he had spent so much on our dates. His indignant tone took me aback, where was the graceful gentleman from all those flower-filled nights. I stood firm and said I just wasn't ready for that step. 
thinking the awkward moment would pass. Instead, his entire demeanor morphed into someone unrecognizable. Joseph loomed over me, insisting he had earned the right to come inside after investing so much in this courtship. I shrank back, but he ignored my growing discomfort. His charm had instantly transformed into a dark, threatening aura. Desperate to get away, I ducked into the building and tried slamming the door behind me. But Joseph forcefully wedged himself into the entrance before I could lock him out. I pleaded with him to leave, but he just cornered me against the wall, any hint of the polished suitor now gone. Terrified, I suddenly heard rapid footsteps approaching from down the hall. My neighbor Raj emerged, quickly sized up the alarming situation, and began shouting at Joseph to get away from me. Joseph seemed momentarily startled, but refused to back down, claiming I had led him on unfairly. But Raj continued his demands, moving steadily toward Joseph with his phone out. Finally, unnerved by the confrontation, Joseph fled for the exit. Raj called after him that he had taken photos and would be reporting the harassment. I nearly collapsed in relief. Raj had possibly saved me from an assault. In the aftermath, I was left questioning how I could have so profoundly misjudged this man. Sure, the posh dates and flowers had seemed a bit much at first, but I rationalized he was just exhibiting classic chivalrous courtship. Now I saw it was all part of an act to manipulate me into trusting him completely. I immediately cut off contact, but Joseph kept calling and messaging relentlessly. He careened from fault apologies to seething blame, outraged that I was denying him after he had invested so much. His true unhinged nature could no longer be concealed. Over the next weeks, I noticed strange acts of vandalism in my building, garbage strewn around, flowers ripped from beds. They seemed like petty attempts at intimidation. Other residents were oblivious, but I knew in my gut Joseph was behind it. I filed reports and gave police the photos Raj had taken of Joseph that night, but with no hard evidence tying him to the incidents, they said there was little they could do beyond documenting it. I realized I would need to be vigilant about keeping Joseph away myself. One evening, I spotted him lurking across the street, using a hoodie as a flimsy disguise. He scurried off as soon as I noticed him, but the next morning I found a dead bird left on my car, a chilling message. I varied my daily patterns and stayed alert, but the stalking continued. I knew I wouldn't feel safe until he was caught, so I set a trap, staking out a bench in front of my building as if waiting for someone. Eventually, Joseph emerged from the shadows and approached me. Just then, Rad appeared with the police ready to pounce. They arrested Joseph, who was found to have a knife and was wanted for other harassment cases too. I shuddered realizing my close call of this dangerous and volatile man. In the aftermath, I kept replaying everything in my mind. Why had I discounted the early warning signs, the overblown extravagance, the pressing to be invited inside, the wounded pride at rejection? But sociopaths like Joseph are masters of disguise, cultivating a flawless image until they gain their trust. By the time his ex slipped, he already felt entitled to me. Hence the rage when I resisted his advances. The kite admirer had just been a ploy to catch me off guard. I'm wiser now in spotting the red flags sooner and trusting my instincts. Joseph nearly charmed and terrorized me into becoming a headline before I reclaimed power over my own safety. It's left me wary of lavish suitors eager to sweep me off my feet. I'm rebuilding my confidence, but it may be some time before I put myself out there on an app again. Fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. I won't let that happen. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.